Well, hello, hello, guys. You're listening to Beauty Bites with Dr. K, Secrets of a Plastic Surgeon. And today on the podcast, I'd like to welcome my very special friend all the way from Spain, Dr. Gabriela Casabuena. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure. The so new reality of being here and in the U.S. at the same time. That's right. It's the new reality of coronavirus, and we're in almost at the tail end of... Um, quarantine, but LA has had a big resurgence. How is Spain doing? Well, right now in the area I live, it's really okay. I mean, it's, it's not growing too much. We had like one or two cases, but I live in a very small town. Marbella is really small. <laughs> so just to give you guys a little bit of background, um, Gabby is a dermatologist. And how many years have you been in practice? More than 15, right? Yeah, 20, almost 19 years. 19 years. I and my residency in 2001. Okay, so something's going on with your audio where it's sounding a little warbly. Um, do, you have, do you have um, AirPods? Yeah, I forgot that. Let me see if I, I don't have any earphone here. If I put myself closer, is it better? Yeah, that's much better. That's okay. better like that. Okay. All right. Um, let's say that again. So Dr. Castabona has dedicated the first 10 years of her career to mastering cosmetic rejuvenation of the face and body. And she's been in practice for almost 19 years. Much of her last five years, she's been training people all across the world and her expertise is international. She has come to Europe, Latin America, and the United States and features her expertise in cancer, surgery, reconstructive skills, especially oculoplastics, and currently facial aesthetics, um, especially her work with hyperdilute calcium hydroxyl appetite is really amazing. So um, you are originally in Durham and you sw shifted to now a little combination of more surgical and interventional procedures too. How are you finding that? Well, actually, I mean, I trained for five years in uh, Mo surgery. Uh, in, the, in the beginning of 2010, I started and until 2015. And from that on, my vision in the cosmetic uh, procedures completely changed. I don't know. I have the sense that you have a more 3D view of the patient, a much better aesthetic, not only the sense, because the sense of aesthetic is something I don't know, you cannot teach really, in my opinion. I mean, the art of aesthetics, something you develop on your own. Something, mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a combination of your, your knowledge, your background, and also what you study. You study arts or other things, you know? But the thing is, it gives you more of, um, you're more secure to do things and try new things and go to more dangerous areas like temple, around the eyes a little bit with more um, creativity, let's say. So the way I treated tear trough, let's say, after I've been exposed to eye surgery so much, it changed completely because then I understand how the vectors around the eye works and how the hyaluronic acid, let's say, could help me much more than just to, 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 to try to be a, a fold corrector. Yes, I definitely feel that. I'm a facial plastic surgeon, and my training's also head and neck surgery, and just the act of you know, peeling away the skin, understanding the muscles and the fat planes, and what you're actually touching with your needle in your head, you have this three-dimensional image of where you're placing your filler almost like it's a cartilage graft or like it's a, a fat bolster. So I think you're absolutely right. And there is so much artistry in what we do too. There really I is. I agree. Yeah, like you almost have to pick your injector based on what is their artistic aesthetic, like who is their muse, their beauty goal, because you're gonna mm -hmm. end up looking like that depending on who you choose, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Definitely. And I mean, we are not, I always say that we are two things that are not really medical, which is, um, let's say, emotional advisor, because sometimes we have to filter a little bit the intention, the expectation, 
these models that they put as a, a, a role model or, or something like this. And sometimes they are so different than my features. If I try to imitate that on the patient, it will be a monster and not a beauty. So mm -hmm. we are a little bit this filter. And also we, we are budget advisors. So <laughs> we got right. two other things, right? Practically speaking, we have to say, what's the maximum use of your budget right now? Where should we place that? <laughs> and uh, let's try to figure out what to do with the budget you have for the best result, right? So, yeah, yeah, but actually those are the best patients, the ones that trust you fully, where they say, well, this is my budget. Where do you want to put it? Because then I can bring out, you know, the areas that I want to enhance that look exactly. pretty. Yeah, exactly. Well, people listening may not know that you're a mother. How many children do you have? <laughs> Six. Six. She's in that exclusive club of women surgeons who dominate research, science, and medicine and still run a house with six children. I'm impressed because I have four and I can barely keep up. <laughs> and you have twins. Well, <laughs> yeah, I have twins also in the middle. How old are your twins? Um, well, my oldest one is 18, then I have the tweens with 14, then I have uh, one with 13, and then I have two babies. One is almost two, and the other one is 11 months. Oh my goodness. Well, 11 months and, and nine months. So, I mean, there are two small babies also. It's like baby twins also. <laughs> That's yeah, exactly, exactly. You look amazing. You do not look like you just had a baby this year. And in the middle of everything, she's conducting her research. That's so important to what we do. The, the work you're doing on hyperdilute um, radius or calcium hydroxyl appetite is so interesting. And it's just barely making its way to the United States in terms of being used more so. Tell us a little bit about... Um, how you're using that in your practice? Um, mostly I use, I, I always say that um, calcium hydroxyapatite dilute is a very predictable and, and very efficient way. I used to use other kinds of biosimulators, especially for the body. But for me, really, it was, I mean, I like not fast results because you depend on the patient to produce collagen and it takes time. Mm -hmm. But in fact, I mean, I don't have to do six sessions or seven sessions to, to have a 30% result. For me, if I do three sessions on a patient and I still get 30% result, it's a failure, in my opinion. Mm. So, I mean, how can we deal with that? So, my research goes more along that, and this is why I start using in different um, indications and try to, to do research to understand what goes right and why it went wrong and how to do it right. So mostly I use radius for uh, face. Millennials, like not millennials, but uh, let's say uh, a step forward in between 30 and 40. I think it's an amazing tool for preventive mm -hmm. because it treats not only the skin, the deep dermis, but also the connection in between the skin and the mask for the face is really, really good in my opinion. Um, for if the body, to, I, I was just going to say that connection between the skin and this mass. If you talk to facelift surgeons, there's a little controversy because they don't love these biostimulator products. Um, like myself doing facelift surgery, it does cause a lot of fibrosis and tethering of the skin. It makes dissection a little bit difficult. What do you say to that? Yeah, I did biopsies and I did surgery on the body after radius. And as I did the biopsies along six months, one of the first studies I published on technology and, and calcium hydroxyapatite and hyaluronic acid, I remember that when I did the surgery, the problem is the dilution. So if you apply the calcium hydroxyapatite concentrate in the subcutaneous level in between this mass and the skin, it will be fibrotic for, for many years. Mm -hmm. The thing is, when you dilute, the recommendation I give, my husband is a plastic surgeon, so the recommendation I give is if the patient is willing to do, uh, like in the, in the next six month plastic surgery, don't do by simulators. Because I would say it takes six months for, it to, for the planes to be really dissectable, let's say, mm -hmm. because the problem is the dissection, you lose the plane. Mm -hmm. For facelift, this is one of the most important 
things in a technique, as far as I understand. So um, I would advise from six months to a year of distance. But I rarely see problems. Like here, he operated patients that I did radius already, and friends of mine operated. And in, on my training, I did, on my research, I did operations on body for, for, for skin excision. And I could see that depending on the area, because I tested different dilutions, the, the way, when I diluted like one to one or more, you rarely see anything when you dissect. If you dilute less than that, then it can be a year after and you still see a lot of fibrosis around. Interesting. And do you think that the tissue changes with the calcium, like calcifications or, you know, microscopic changes are going to be a problem? Like if I'm using hyperdilute radius in the neck, am I going to affect older people's carotid ultrasounds and studies that they may have done, imaging studies and that kind of a thing? You mean the reflection, if it's going to be, yes. I mean, mm -hmm. no. Not really. Yeah. Not really. Why do I, you... I mean, even in the biopsy, it's, it's, it's hard to find after a while. You, you cannot find the particles. Interesting. And I really never seen a patient. Uh, I'm doing a lot of uh, ultrasound right now and guiding my, my procedures before and after with ultrasound. Mm -hmm. And even in the ultrasound, you cannot see absolutely anything with dilute radius. Absolutely anything. You can yeah. see a flow during the injection. You see the tissue moving, but you don't see the, the reflection of the white. Different, and if you inject concentrated as a filler, you can see the hyperechoic uh, uh, hyper uh, hyper uh, area with the, the reflection. So you see a whitish thing as if it was a bone. But okay. if it's diluted, you don't even see. You see the moving of the tissue. So I don't, Very I mean, I've had patients that had um, MRI for, for other reasons and nobody said anything about the radius injected in the neck or the chest or anything. Interesting. Why do you think that calcium has such an active stimulating um, property to the skin? Like why? Why? It's such an inert That's an mineral. That's an and you would think that it shouldn't trigger anything. Um, actually, um, the thing is, any particle that is strange for the body is a foreign body. Okay? Mm -hmm. So it's like breast implant. It's a foreign body. Depending on the size or not, independently, the body will read it as a foreign body. So you create a foreign body reaction. That's, that's for me, the principle of biostimulation. But the thing is, the surface, the size plays a huge role in immune stimulation and all this stuff and how the collagen is deposited. Another thing, so if you have a very irregular surface, it's almost like breast implant. So if you have a very irregular surface, you have a less organized deposit of collagen around, so it gets to a very tight fibrosis. Mm -hmm. And if you have a more regular, but not completely plain, but a slightly irregular, but still regular surface and small particles, you have less this. I mean, I was doing a revision to, for a timeline of AJ, and I was looking at Lemper uh, publications from 2003, and he already described biopsies showing the different surfaces of different uh, injectables like permanent, non-permanent, and he described the reaction. So uh, it's very interesting because in my on my research, I did a lot of biopsies. I've never found a granuloma on a dilute radius or dilute calcium hydroxyapatite. Never. Mm -hmm. What I found is giant cells sometimes, and you you find an inflammation around, but I never found the granuloma. If you compare to bigger particles, particles that are bigger than 45 microns, particles that are very irregular, you see a lot of granuloma around because mm -hmm. the stimulation of, and the T regular, the, the lymphocyte T regulators, they're less stimulated and you have a different deposit of, of collagen. Yeah. Another thing that it's interesting with um, the particle as a, any strange particle for the body, is that the amount of particles around the fibroblast, this is a recent research I did 
in vitro and in vivo. So it's, it's very interesting because when you have small number of particles per fibroblast, you have uh, less stimulation of collagen. So if you dilute too much your product, you have very low production of collagen. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems we have the threshold in between safety and efficacy. What's your ideal dilution that you're using, for example, for a face wash and then a neck wash? One to one, always. I only use one to two in two situations for body, for high BMI patients. Mm -hmm. And remember that we have to use. Normally, I, I limit myself one syringe of 1.5 to 100 centimeters square. Mm -hmm. And to guarantee the certain amount of particles per area, according to the diffusion that you gain with one-to-one -one dilution. But if you're using one-to-two, you have more diffusion, not only lateral, but also depthness. So it's good because if the superficial fascia is deeper on the high BMI, it's good for me to get deeper with the product, but I have to guarantee the same amount of particles. So I use two syringes per hundred centimeters square. So this is the only indication for me for one to two dilution. For me, I, I never use one to two dilution uh, in, in other, not per region, region but I, I have colleagues that use a lot in the neck and chest. They prefer the one to two. Right, and even in the decollete where the skin is very thin, you're still using one to one. And then usually two sessions of treatment is pretty good for creating nice padding and neocollagenization, right? And about six weeks apart. So for people listening, like if you're trying to incorporate this into your practice, um, typical one-to-one -one dilution, one to you know one syringe per hundred centimeter square is about six weeks apart in two sessions. And I've been finding that really very effective, especially nice for the crepey neck which has so yeah. little in terms of treatment. The interior part, we have very few procedures that we can do here and that it, it are as, a, as effective. Even microfocus ultrasound, you cannot really treat the depthness. You can use the 1.5 if you want, but it's really, I mean, it takes a lot. I mean, in my experience, uh, microfocus ultrasound alone is not a good uh, option for treating this area, but radius is uh, calcium hydroxyapatite is really, really good, diluted. Have you found the microfocus ultrasound to take away some of the dermal thickness in very thin patients if it's used by itself? And that's a treatment like Ulthera. Um, no, I didn't have this feeling, but um, uh, normally when I use microfocus ultrasound, it's very rare that I use a loan for the lower neck. Mm -hmm. Normally I combine with calcium hydroxyapatite. So maybe I'm biased, you know, I don't, I don't have the same experience as other people for the lower neck because I'm thickening the dermis anyway with the calcium hydroxyapatite. So maybe, but I've maybe. never, I've never had this impression. No. Are there any areas that you think are off limits, like around the periocular temples, you know, anything that you think is high risk in terms of hyperdilute treatments? Uh, I wouldn't go around the eyes, not for sure not. Yeah. Uh, I've seen a lot of complications uh, with this. Even diluted, I wouldn't go that far. I mean, it's very hard to separate the muscle and uh, from the subcutaneous. So you might be in risk of injecting inside the muscle and having, you know, reactions. So no, this is a no-go area for, for dilute rate uh, calcium hydroxyapatite for me and also periorbital. Peri I mean, I, I don't do it. I mean, I do around the mentalis area, but not really around uh, the lips. Load your bicularis oris or on top, I don't do it. I think it's so unpredictable because both of those are sphincter muscles and you can have congregation or aggregation of the calcium particles. So yeah, not recommended to do that around the mouth or the eyes. Um, but it's so interesting that you are a mom and you're busy and you have time to run these studies. It's just incredible to me and congratulations and thank you for doing that for the whole world. Like we're all benefiting from your research, um, how on earth do you find time in your busy day? Because <laughs> it's one thing to see patients and have a very busy clinical practice, and I have that too. It's a whole nother layer of complexity and time. It's like, you know, 25% yeah. 20, more work easily to run research studies. How are you finding time for that? Well, I sleep very little. <laughs> 
same. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm never on the sofa watching TV. <laughs> right? <laughs> Theories for me are not a reality. Yeah. So uh, no, I'm just kidding. But I think time log, time log, the, the priorities. You have to prioritize your, your, your time very much. I think uh, I spend a lot of time with my family out of anything research work. I spend a lot of time with them. So I don't spend a lot of time elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Like I don't have a super busy social life, I would say as much as I would have if I didn't have so many kids because my social life is already taken by them more or less. (laughs) So this is one of the things you have to decide, you know, I mean, if you want to go to parties every night and not dinner, not have dinner at home, I mean, it's, it's a decision, but I decided to invest on my family. So I spend most of my time with them on the weekends, on doing the week outside the work, I'm with them. Mm -hmm. I try to balance a little bit my days in between the babies that have a complete different schedule than the big ones. So I try to to divide my day a little bit in between staying some mornings with the babies to go out to parks or the pool or whatever. And in the afternoon separate, like either go to the gym and, and try to do something with the teenager big ones, you know, try to create a common ground in between us. So we have a like a trainer that go, comes and the whole family does the training together. Mm. This is, I mean, find some common ground. I think it's very, very important for, I mean, and oblige you also to pay attention to this. And uh, research and my publications, I do in my spare time, which is normally very early in the morning or during the night. <laughs> <laughs> After everyone's asleep and the husband's yeah. in bed. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Tidy up the house, get the homework done, feed the husband. <laughs> then it's like 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> right? Exactly. So, yeah, I mean, I find time for, I'm very, um, I'm very passionate about things. So I think that those things move me, you know, those things uh, move me and, and I don't know, passion move me, I think, towards this. Yeah. I don't think I would ever stop studying and, and I just did a, a review of the last 15 years of publication on the hyaluronic acid and in the beginning I said, why did I commit to do this? <laughs> but then, you know, after you have a very good overview of what you do and what others are doing and uh, good publications, bad publications, you know, okay. it's a very good way of positioning yourself and also getting into contact with I don't know new findings new things or or maybe curiosities and uh, I don't think I would ever be able to stop uh, moving forward I hope (laughs) I agree because you reach a point in your craft where you're very good at what you do and you don't want the day to just be routine and repetitive and you have to have that intellectual curiosity about why am I doing what I'm doing and also, once you've learned all the rules, I think that you want to start breaking the rules and like pushing the boundary, exactly. right? <laughs> we break the rules. So we teach all the injectors, all the rules, the basics, the foundation, and then we're like, well, I'm going to try it differently because I think I have this, the knowledge of the boundaries now. So yeah, well, one day we were speaking in a meeting and I remember, um, I think it was the, the, Philippe Bouchard from Mert, he was speaking with me and, and he said, but you know, you have to limit yourself sometimes to the science, you know, what's published, what's not published. I said, not at all. Yeah. Science help you to safely break the rules. That's yes. what science does. <laughs> exactly. And it's sometimes quite conventional because it's, you know, really funded and led by leaders who have like a 20 year position in this industry who don't have creative ideas sometimes. And they're just kind of doing the, the rote it's expected research. So it's more of the same. Yes, more of the same. So it's interesting to bring in new players. I will be curious to see how aesthetics changes as women start to dominate this field because like you and I were minorities in plastic surgery and aesthetics, being women and being mothers and like uh-huh. having everything we do, like, you know, it's challenging, but as our voices get to be heard more, it's gonna change the perspective, I think. I'm hoping. Anyway, um, and I think the role of aesthetic procedures, um, your your plastic surgeon. So the role of aesthetic procedures in combination with surgery will change a lot from now on. Yes. In terms of um, 
being an adjunct in, in a junction in a junction to i mean in addition to your your you can do much better um i always have this discussion with my husband in the beginning but now he he's convinced <laughs> because i i always say you know you're gonna redrape a skin on an old bone this is not good you have to restore the bone and then you redrape the skin and the fat and the tightening or whatever you want to reposition but if you don't have a, a good frame a young frame then you re redraping on an old frame is not good and there's nothing surgical good enough to reposition i mean to to restore bone yet there are some research but i there's nothing so you have to rely on non-invasive procedures because not even fat is not good enough for this in, yeah. in, at least in our experience so i mean this is where they merge you know and for the body i think really they will get along more and more together as like neck surgery and necklines i mean which surgery corrects necklines none even okay. if you tight a lot sometimes they end up still, still with the neckline so why not in a surgical the same surgical procedure combine everything and do a a complete um upgrade and know a holistic approach so i think they will be more and more together i think so and i think it should be it should be more respective that's what co consumers want we don't really want to have to have a facelift and have downtime and like i want to push that off as long as possible yeah but, definitely but to your point yeah i think that we need to work on reframing the scaffolding and i absolutely agree about the bone density changes like it's so inevitable that every woman every man is going to have bone density changes of their facial skeleton and truly the the day that we start correcting that is when we'll have really solid area to place foundational fillers and things yeah. like that. so i think that's why i love radius too because it is so good at you know kind of hugging the bone contouring and maybe hopefully yeah. we should do some studies to see if it stimulates um osteoclast to trigger like if you're touching the mandible with your needle and depositing you know is that actually turning on a little bone production locally that would be so interesting yeah, to see. see yes yeah well so tell me what's most popular in your clinic right now what are people asking for well um let's say i think still fillers are the most popular because i'm known for this so maybe that's a bias also but the second thing that lately people are asking very much is the, the microneedling with PRP and PRF. Mm -hmm. They come asking a lot for this, but not the regular, like smooth treatment, you know, more aggressive. I tend to do much more aggressive treatments and also with the nano fat. So, I mean, it's a very interesting procedure. Mm -hmm. And is there any skincare that you're loving as far as like, what are your go-to favorite products for your own routine or what do you put everybody on right now? So I have melasma. So I have eternally to take care of my melasma because I, now I live even more in the sun. So <laughs> even more than some problem, I live in the sun. So um, what I'm loving is um, a new, um, it's not new, but it's an Elbaji product for the night. Mm. Well, it's, it's well, yeah, one of the retinoic acid that, that they use. Mm -hmm. So, and a non retinoic acid also they have, but I, I, I use the brighter life. I really like it because it doesn't irritate the skin. And uh, I really like it for myself. I have a very sensitive skin. I almost cannot use um, retinoic acid. Mm. And uh, another product that I like very much, and I, I think it really, really um, gives you a, like, let's say a Cinderella effect. Mm, that sounds so romantic. Yeah, good. Yeah, it's, um, I, I tried a new product from Dermapen World, which is a hyaloactive. It's like um, very concentrated hyaluronic acid in a very smooth gel, mm. which I didn't give so much in the beginning because I said, well, it's another hyaluronic acid product, whatever. So, uh, but it really gives you a really nice, it's kind of a lifting effect with the Cinderella effect. And um, if you want to use foundation on top, uh, this is a product for the night. So you cannot use foundation on top of this because it gives you a little bit of rolling. So it's not oh, okay. really good for during the day. So I use it during the night. And for the eyes, there is a um, European, I'm not sure this is in US, 
but it's an European brand called Contabria. Mm-hmm. And uh, the one who have the HelioCare, it's the same brand. Wait, say they that have, Say that one more time and lean forward a little. You're just cracking up a little for the eyes. Yeah, the, 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 for the eyes, Cantabria. It's the, the, the owner of the HelioCare, Nostrata, this. Mm. So they have a line in Europe that's called All Skin Med, and they have a growth factor for around the eye with a little bit of sparkle. So oh. when you use, it really gives you a really nice, um, sometimes if you don't have like dark circles or anything that's huge, you cannot use any correction because it gives you a little bit of a sparkle reflection and light. Mm. So I really like it. Oh, nice. Those sound amazing. I'll have to get some. <laughs> um, are you coming back to the United States anytime soon? And do you feel like... Um, COVID and quarantine are going to settle down in Spain and Europe? Well, I think in Spain, maybe it will be faster because we're in the second wave. And I think United States is in the first and the second all the all together. <laughs> but yeah. Um, yeah, so well, depending on the state, but I hope so. I really hope I had the hopes of going to US. I had some trainings that I had to cancel in US and I was very sad about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but my next appointment in U.S. will be next year in March. Mm-hmm. Then I should be flying to Raleigh. <laughs> so, well, you'll have to yeah. come visit me in Los Angeles too. I would love to have you here and come and lecture with my modern aesthetics I would love course. To. Yes, I would love to. Yeah, if you, in case you don't know it, you're one of my mentors and role models. Being, you know, a woman having lots of kids, like. I have four kids. I have twins also. We're all in the same club. <laughs> but um, I really think it's amazing what you're doing with your research. And do you have any tips and advice for young women in dermatology or plastic surgery or medicine starting out, how to focus yourself, how to get involved to do research? Passion in the first time uh, is what moves you because there are some moments in research that you want to give up. The ethical committee gives you a headache and you want to just throw everything away. But anyway, I think um, one thing that is very good tip, since you're a beginner and you're beginning your career, just record everything. Like every, do like a a follow-up um, database for your patients in terms of safety, in, in ter- but as a follow-up database. Because in terms of ethical committee, you can do very good retrospective studies if you have a secondary database from a database that you use for follow, following the patients in terms of satisfaction and the complications you might have and following up you know, the treatment plans. So it's easier for you to start doing research on your own database if you have a secondary database, non-identifiable. So if you begin and you think about this, just record and have um, a good recording of all the parameters, like the points of toxin you use and the amount. So there are some softwares that you can even put the points Mm -hmm. and, and choose the amount. So this is what I would do and I've been doing for many years in Brazil and helped me a lot because uh, then you can do very good retrospective studies. And I have one now that I'm going to submit with 567 patients I treated combined with microfocus ultrasound. I use some exclusion criteria. So it's just patients that treated body with both treatments in the same day. Mm. And I had that a database to look at, you know, so you can cross Uh, information and get a lot of good conclusions to help us to do better you know how what get patients satisfied and what didn't you know what kind of treatment so you can have an idea on that yeah track your own yeah track your own practice and your own progress and yeah and in terms of having kids during residency during training you know in the after when you're in private practice what's your advice for women starting out um prioritize your family always. Um, But that doesn't mean you have to give up on your dream. Mm -hmm. That means that sometimes you have to go slower and uh, have a very, very clear, um, let's say, relationship with your partner Mm -hmm. in terms of beliefs, how 
does he see helping you? So the roles needs to be really well um, established because I had two experiences. So I'm, I'm married the second time and I was mature enough to position myself in a way of saying, look, we can restart. I can restart and have a family as long as you help me. So it's not all on me. Yeah, exactly. So it's not about feminism. I'm not super fan of, I mean, independence. I'm a woman. I don't do anything. It's not that. I think there are things that women do better than men. But all I'm saying is just because of our, our genetics, our, the, the way we are built, it's not because they cannot do it. Mm -hmm. But in terms of responsibility, it has to be a share, you know, and, and we have to share. Yeah, I think it's hard for men too, or traditional roles where, you know, there's traditional division of labor. Like sometimes you need, you need that in a household. Like you do have to divide the labor and understand that kids is a lot of labor actually. But um, it's important to not let go of who you are as an individual, like the girl you were when you're in your 20s and you're dreaming about all the big things you're going to do because so suddenly you have kids and your focus shifts as it should to the children. But you have to retain that original dream and drive. I think it's so important to not. That, that happened it. to me. That happened to me when I had my four kids at some point. And my, my smaller one was three years old. I always wanted to do more surgery. I didn't do it in the beginning. So then I pursued my dream because I, I, I wasn't happy. Yeah. You know? So I said, I mean, I, I want to pursue my dream. So I waited until my smaller one was three. Yeah. And then I went. The thing is, I had to do residency again, and I had to go to U.S., to Argentina. It was harder to do the training because I had my family, and I had to support them and all this stuff. But even though, it didn't stop me. You find a way. You definitely find a way. And I, I, always, I you give up a lot being a mother, but you do it with love and with knowledge that that's the most important role that you'll ever play in your life, I think. And um, I, you know sacrificed and put my kids first for the first 10, 10 years when I could have been going to meetings and publishing and doing stuff, but it's worth it in the long run. And then you come I back to you. your dreams as long as you can, you know, restart, re-trigger as soon as they can take care of themselves, feed themselves and they have, I agree. They have Wi-Fi, they're good. <laughs> you can get back to doing other so things. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, it's been such a pleasure chatting with you. I can't wait to do some research together. I'm going to do a study sure. for hyperdilute radius for treatment of the buttocks for cellulite dimples and for volumization. And hopefully we can collaborate on something sometime soon. Um, and next time you're here, of course, you're welcome to come visit Los Angeles and me, Spain. You can come to Marbella whenever you want. I love, I would love to. It sounds so romantic. <laughs> Um, and I just, where can l listeners find you on your various social handles if they want to check out some of your work and your website? Uh, my website, well, is the clinic website now. So it's www.oceanclinic.com. And uh, my, my social media is Instagram. So Gabriella Casabona is Perfect. my Instagram. Perfect. Wonderful. And then don't forget to find me on my Instagram doing amazing things with people's faces. It's beauty by Dr. K D R K A Y. And our website is the same beauty by Dr. K.com. That's where you can find information on how to come and see us, try some hyper dilute radius for necks, bodies everywhere. Um, that's it for now, guys. Stay beautiful. Don't forget to stay focused on your passions. Be a woman, be a boss girl, do your research and go get it all. Love you. Stay beautiful.